Coming up on Smart Tech Today, we have got a packed show. Once again, we start out by talking about a feature that is meant for kids for the Apple Watch that may also be great for adults. Plus, a lot of talk about Apple's new HomePod and so much Google news, including the Google Home getting a feature that's been part of Amazon's ecosystem for a while, uh, the discontinuation of the Google Nest secure alarm system, a little bit of chat about Quibi and our picks of the week. Stay tuned because there's so much in store. Smart Tech Today is brought to you from Twit's LastPass Studios. You're focused on security, but are your employees? Well, LastPass can ensure that they are by making access and authentication seamless, whether employees are working in the office or remotely. Visit lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Welcome to Smart Tech Today, where we explain the exciting, the dynamic, and the sometimes confusing subject that is the Internet of Things. I am Micah Sargent. And I am Matthew Casanelli. Hello, Micah. Hi. 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 How are you? Oh, doing good. How about you? Oh, peachy keen. Peachy keen. Thanks for asking. <sighs> I, uh, I am excited because folks are... Settling in, I think, at this point with new updates for their phones, maybe new phones mm -hmm. in general, but certainly if they have devices by now, they've been either nagged enough or mm. it's gotten to the point where they've had their phone plugged in overnight or their watch charging overnight uh, and those automatic updates have taken hold. They have grasped your yes. uh, your your desire to to run from change and have said no. No, we move bravely and strongly into the future together. Huzzah! Five we four. take a leap into the cold <laughs> pool and we emerge victorious. <sighs> Basically, all that's to say, you, you probably have updates on your iOS devices, your watchOS devices, uh. and your Android devices. I mean, they all get updates. Uh, but we want to talk about a new feature that's come to... The, the Apple Watch, uh, courtesy of the latest version of watchOS, and that is, and I think this, yeah, in watchOS 7, uh, that has a feature called school time. Um, school time at the Apple event was marketed, was, was introduced, was shown as a way to uh, use an Apple Watch at school, kind of for children, uh, so that the teacher knew and the student knew that this is focus time. This is time to, you know, do your work. And I think more importantly that you weren't sort of cheating or looking at your phone or doing anything else and that you wouldn't be distracted. And I, there are two quick things I want to point out. There was um, a conversation a while back on Twit. I can remember watching an episode of Twit uh, with Odocta. And Odocta was talking about his daughter um, having an Apple Watch and how he kind of had to have a disagreement not only with teachers but with the um, administration at the school because they were not interested in letting her have her Apple watch and use it or rather wear it during class, uh, because of any implications. And he said, first of all, my daughter will not use it to cheat because I trust her and she knows that that is not an okay thing. And second of all, my daughter will have her Apple watch because if there is ever a situation where she is unsafe at school and needs to have this device in order to contact mm -hmm. me, she will have this device in order to contact me. Um, and this was not too long after one of the many uh, mass shootings that happen in the United States uh, in a oh, given geez. year. And so, you know, it was, it was, important for him that his daughter had that ability. Um, and so I think that as more people, uh, I mean, the Apple Watch is just selling, 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 selling. More people are getting Apple Watches than ever before and continue to get Apple Watches. And Apple is marketing the Apple Watch now as sort of a starter iPhone, uh, a way to, mm -hmm. to let a child kind of start with that experience of being able to reach out and communicate with friends and family without going all the way into it uh, by getting them a phone. And so this feature kind of helps with that because they can have their watch at school, but the teacher can quickly see that yellow 
school bus yellow screen and know that the watch is in uh, school time mode, which says uh, you cannot see kind of anything outside of uh, checking the time and getting emergency notifications. And of course, it can all be set and edited by the, oh, you've got school time mode enabled yeah, right there. Exactly. Uh, I'm not allowed to check my watch. By a parent. But Matthew, you ha- you found a great article from Gizmodo. No, from uh, Lifehacker. Uh, yeah. Do you want to tell us kind of what the argument is here? Um, yeah, this is from David Murphy, who's their senior technology editor. And like any good n- nerd, he's like, wait a second, I can use this too, <laughs> which is awesome. So basically, all you need to do is go into control center on your watch by swiping up from the bottom and then edit the screen. And then you can add in school time and then anybody can basically turn it on and kind of act as a do not disturb while schooling, like (laughs) working kind of situation. So because people have hacked the do not disturb while driving thing where if you automatically or if you manually activate it and then you customize the message, you can just say, I'm really busy right now. If you send me a message again, it'll come through kind of thing. But this let's emergency contact things come emergency notifications come through in time but not that same kind of messaging thing so this is pretty interesting it's kind of just a it's it's a funny way to not get distracted and also kind of just see that big yellow watch face yourself without having to switch into that watch face um or like have it looks kind of like the i don't know it's kind of a unique face so it's probably a good little mentality thing like yellow means work or something like that so yellow means slow down chap you (laughs) need to get back to work (laughs) yeah i like that that's Uh, good that's better (laughs) uh up next i have been uh, absolutely annoying the pants off of my partner with a new feature (laughs) that has come to the home pod uh apple released an update to ios uh, that included an update to the home pod and with it came apple's again, announced at its recent event, uh, intercom feature. We had talked last time about, is this going to be a feature where you have to have a HomePod to be able to do intercom? Is it only going to be for the HomePod mini or will the current HomePod be able to work with it? And it was kind of funny because I missed some messages from Matthew that he had sent me earlier in the day talking about intercom. And later Mm. that day, I got the update, installed the update, sent him some messages and was like, look, intercom works with the current HomePod. And so it was kind of a funny back and forth there. Um, But essentially, if you have a HomePod, you can uh, update your HomePod to the latest version. And upon doing so, you get access to intercom. You can talk directly to the HomePod and say, hey, S-I-R-I, intercom, and then you kind of say a message or uh, you can... There's there's another key You can ask it to send a message to a specific room or it's... I don't. I think what's kind of confusing is it's slow. It's part of a slow rollout. So in iOS fourteen point two betas, they already have it built into the home app, and then I think some of the inter device connection stuff is going to be coming probably when the HomePod Mini actually launches. So that's why I was kind of surprised that they just. I mean, they put fourteen point one out because the new phones were coming out, and so mm-hmm. they kind of slid this feature in there. So there's part of it for now, but it is pretty cool because you can send a broadcast to the whole home and just be like dinner's ready kind of situation, which is nice. Um, and then they also added a couple other features. Like if you ask for directions or something nearby, when you get into the car, it will show that in the maps interface in CarPlay, which is pretty cool. So it's kind of actually using those smart smarts. If you get directions, you probably want to actually go there once you're driving. So that makes sense. And then having multiple name timers and being able to say when you're upstairs, stop the timer downstairs or something like that. Um, and then even, I don't think I've ever tried saying continue my podcast. And I actually was using the home pod to play some podcasts this morning. So I would have used this cause I couldn't figure out how to just play the latest podcast as opposed to start playing some sort of podcast. Um, but they have multi user voice recognition. So My girlfriend could also play her podcasts on there. So, and oh yeah, the last one is if you ask Siri to search for something on the web, you can forward it to your phone too. So 
that's going to be a nice way to kind of take more advantage of the Siri features from the HomePod and pass it along to your other devices because that's always been a little bit frustrating when it doesn't quite, <laughs> it's like, I just can't do that. And you're like, great, I have a bunch of other devices that could. Let's, t- let's handle it there. All right, so I want to show you really quick what the feature looks like because it's kind of interesting. You don't have to just have um, this as a... Uh, as you don't have to talk to the HomePod as the only way to make this happen. In fact, what you can do, and let me, I'll keep myself on view so you know I'm not disappeared, uh, is in the top right corner of the Home app, there's now a little intercom button. And I can hit that button. It's probably going to set off my dogs, but we'll do this really quick. And I can tap it and say, hello, Henry and Mizzy. And then I say, done. And now my HomePod downstairs will chime And then it will put out that message and will the dogs, of course, are the only ones that are here right now. So they will hear it and probably be very disturbed by it. But uh, the point is you get to do that from the home app as well, which I kind of like. It's not just a feature that's available in um, but by having to speak to the home pod. And of course, it works with with CarPlay and with some other devices as well. Are you um, on the beta? Because I... I thought I saw last, I put it out in my newsletter that you could, I put a shortcut that's just open the intercom and it just opens the home app. But then somebody was like, oh, it's only on 14.2 or something. So oh, I, this might a, be a, I always I, get confused when I <laughs> am, yeah, when they're I didn't think that I had because this is the iPhone 12 Pro and I didn't think that I had this on the beta, but I might have this on the beta. Hmm. So I apologize if that's the case. Um, well, so, we can say at least... At some point, you will be able to use the home app to interface with intercom as well. And then it's not just going to be a speak and be heard kind of feature. Um, So I think that's kind of cool. Uh, Let's see. They've got like personal updates coming to where it'll... I've got morning routine type shortcuts that will redo the news and weather and calendar appointments. But they're just going to make it a natural feature, which is cool. And also um, home theater support for... If you have the original HomePods, you can get the whole Dolby Atmos audio, even from a single HomePod, which is going to be interesting. I haven't, I guess it's not out yet, but yeah, I want to try that because I've listened to, I watched um, Remnant originally with just one HomePod as a test to hear what it was like because that whole movie has kind of like a a sound bed throughout the whole thing that kind of goes like, and for like really intense oh, yeah. at moments. Um and it sounded really good from just, I like put the HomePod on the coffee table and stuff. So I'm going to have to try this. Cool. Yeah. Um, the other thing is, oh, a, a piece from Dan Morin in Macworld about the HomePod mini and kind of its place in the in Apple's own lineup, but also its place in the larger smart speaker ecosystem, which is uh, the bigger thing. You've got a $99 Amazon Echo, a $99 Nest Audio, and now a $99 HomePod Mini. Um, and what that means in terms of uh, in terms of competition, I think. And yeah. it's interesting. You know, we the HomePod Mini is the going to be the the last player in the space. The um, Nest Audio and the HomePod, or excuse me, the Nest Audio and the Amazon Echo, I think, will be out and about before. Certainly, the I have one of the new Amazon Echoes, the the Orbs, and uh, it of course is out before the the HomePod Mini is. Mm-hmm. And I think, yeah, I mean, folks have, have had and talked about the, the Nest Audio. So Apple's coming late uh, with its device, but I mean, it kind of already is the last player in all of these things. Um, yeah. And he makes I, a good point too, that for a lot of people, just the original HomePod was way too expensive for, it's kind of like a nice to have, but definitely not a need to have. And Ironically, I could see myself probably spending as much on three HomePod menus or something like that. But again, you get a bunch of coverage. The HomePod original one can blow away your house if you need it, but it is still like nice oh to my. have. I can't even, I can't use the HomePod on my desk at more than 50% without it just being way too loud for this space. So Yeah, and it's all in the base, I, I feel. Um, I often use, because... 
I live I live in a town home, so there's no one above me or below me, but there are people yeah. to my left and to my right. And I really miss if there's one thing I miss about Missouri, um, and the more time, the more wildfires and other things happen here, the more I miss Missouri. But um, the <laughs> one thing that I really miss about Missouri was the affordable living. And I was in a three bedroom home with neighbors, but they were in detached homes on either side mm-hmm. of me. Um, and so I could play music in my whole house and th- I didn't have any concern. I didn't have any anxiety about it here. I set my home pod to like 30% and I'm already getting a little anxious about it because yeah, I'm worried exactly. about the bass getting into the other houses. So I most often end up listening to music and stuff with headphones or some other uh, way or, you know, very low volume. And that kind of bugs me. So yeah, kind of it, it's, purpose, yeah. yeah. So it's kind of weird to say, but, I am with you on this um, smaller speaker, maybe providing for good sound, but with less power uh, and that being mm-hmm. a good thing because, yeah, I use um, in, in the iPhone, if you're playing music from the music app, you can go into your settings, go into music and go into EQ and there's a bass reducer uh, option in the EQ. And I will mm-hmm. use that when I'm playing music from the HomePod because otherwise that thing is just like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And those low frequency sounds just, you know, go through and vibrate yeah. other people's homes. And ugh, I, I get anxious about it. Don't like that. So I can really see this like one of Dan's points in the article too, is that it kind of like saved the HomePod line because for a lot of people, they just totally wrote it off. And now, especially compared to those other speakers in the same price point, if it does just, if it is a better audio product, I feel like a lot of people will end up investing and then maybe they buy a HomePod up the line also. So it kind of, it seems like this makes sense for what Apple's strategy was this whole time, but we've all been sitting here being like, this is really expensive and people just kind of wrote it off. So I'm curious if this is going to convince a lot of people to switch to HomePod or something like that from the Echo environment, especially, or like all of the free (laughs) Nest minis that they've been giving out and things like that. So it'll be an interesting holiday gear season, kind of Black Friday coming up and all that. So, Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, up next, let's talk about some home kit stuff because there have been quite a few home kit updates. Sure. The first home kit update comes from uh, Miros, 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 yeah. Miros, <laughs> Moss. You know, if you say it uh, f- multiple <laughs> times and you say it fast enough, you can make it sound like pretty much anything. Uh, this company it's has. A <laughs> this company has another uh, smart lamp out after the introduction of its first uh, Wi-Fi smart table lamp. And it kind of, you know, it's got some Philips Hue vibes, I would say. Uh, but mm-hmm. these are, I would say, cost-friendly, cost-effective um, models that provide you with some color options, some, you know, some ambiance, as it were without breaking the bank. And now there's an even smaller version of the lamp that still works with HomeKit, works with ALEXA, works with the Google Assistant and other devices. Um, What I do enjoy is the fact that it is a Wi-Fi enabled device. So Mm -hmm. you don't have to have a hub for it or anything like that. Um, But once again, I always have to look to luminance as the luminance output as the sort of measure of the value of a light to me Mm -hmm. and the less luminance it provides the less i am um i mean the less i'm interested frankly in in the device because i think a light should be just that a a device an object that provides light (laughs) so i don't know (laughs) Um, i don't actually see the stat for that on that yeah i'm not seeing it either Um, it's it doesn't look very bright is what i will say yeah i think that's kind of my 
reason for including this was because it's the a smaller, cheaper version of what was like a larger equivalent from a couple months ago or last month. But I have the Eve orb over here. Um, grab it. And I don't, I guess this one isn't wireless. So that that's one of the benefits of the orb type thing. But I like it as we've talked in the past about using, um, is it Belkin's charger thing that has the light on it? Um, or no, iDevices. That's right. Um, they all have using them as status indicators. So kind of using a shortcut or something like that or an automation to turn one of these lights to blue when it's time to do your planning work or purple when it's time to record smart tech today is what I try to do. Um, sort of as a little ambient light and just being only 30 bucks. This seems like a pretty solid use for that. It's like not don't buy this to light up your room, but to add an accent color or something like that, I'd say, or like a nightlight kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Especially as a nightlight, they, I show, they show the, the baby, uh, next to <laughs> one of the, the videos or next to one of the photos. Um, and I think that that kind of gives you an idea. Interestingly, even on its own page, uh, I've looked at the specs and I'm not seeing any <laughs> luminance measurements. They're so. not going for brightness. Yeah. Yeah. And like the definitely. color quality too is going to be interesting to see, but I do think Maras as a line is a, an affordable way to get into HomeKit where a lot of stuff starts to be 50 about $50, $60, $70. And it just kind of, for a lot of people, doesn't meet, meet the standards. So something that's a little bit cheaper that's maybe not as bright and not as colorful but is just HomeKit compatible at all is like, I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe I that's, see that. I was like, one of my thoughts was that the HomeKit line is larger than we think just in the past year of doing this show, but also... Some of it is not always the best quality, but I guess that's still having options is a great thing compared to usually that's not the case with home uh, with HomeKit. So exactly, yeah, there are a lot more options than maybe we realize. I think that's a, a good point. And um, you know, I used to say KooGeek, K O O G or K O O Geek was the uh, go to for. Home kit on a budget, um, but it looks like Maras has some of the options that Kugeek ended up kicking to the curb that I really liked, um, which is mm. its in wall switches. So Kugeek had this really cool, um, it was a two gang in wall switch that lets you with one, uh, or actually, excuse me, it's one gang, meaning that it takes up one space but it has two mm -hmm. different switches built into it. And so you could turn on and off uh, two things. And that was important for me because I had uh -oh. um, a room where the fan was wired to one switch and the light was wired to another. And so mm -hmm. I was able to just take up that one space, wire the fan and the light to it and have those independently controlled. Um, it looks like Kugi, or excuse me, uh, Maras is offering some of that functionality uh, in its different devices. There's a single yeah. pole switch, a three way switch, a dimmable switch, um, a dimmer and remote kit, a dimmable switch kit, a wall switch, two way wall switch, and some other options available, including a three gang wall switch. Um, which are rare in the now that one I guess does not work with HomeKit so um, but it does work with the Google Assistant Alexa uh, and has the different options there so interesting I'm gonna have to pay uh, attention to to Maras and see yeah. what uh, products it's working on I've got their outdoor um, plug and that's what automates my backyard lights when I I have the Eve door sensor and whenever that opens at night or like at around 4 p.m. until like 9 a.m. or something. I don't know. I kind of change it depending on the seasons. But then string, just Amazon basic string lights turn on that are along our fence. And that's kind of given our backyard a nice little chill thing. Like we had a social distance hangout with our friends this uh, weekend in our backyard, like masks, everything nice. opposite sides of the yard. But I was just <laughs> sitting out there and I was like, Siri, turn on the backyard. And I was like, oh, yeah, that was nice. <laughs> that is nice. Yeah. Um, I also Especially love that we... Dark. 
we always uh. feel um, <sighs> ah, maybe I won't go into it. No, I'm going to go into it really quickly. Um, it's interesting how those of us who are taking this thing very seriously always feel it's important that whenever we talk about doing, <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. spending any time around other people that were very clear, like, okay, I promised that I did it this way and I did it this way and I did it that way. Um, and meanwhile, there are folks that are just like, I don't care about any of it. And, you know, they don't yeah. feel beholden to explain themselves. Um Let's move on. So Nanoleaf had a press event. I, I don't know if you tuned in live. I ended up, um, I, didn't. I was, I think I had a meeting whenever the, the live event was going on. So I watched the recap afterward hmm. uh, where it announced some new options for its lighting products. They're notoriously expensive. And it was kind of interesting. The uh, CEO had a question, a Q&A after the event. And one <laughs> of the questions that was asked was, why are your products so expensive? And, you know, he acknowledged that they were expensive and basically said what was kind of my argument the whole time. Um, so it was good to see this confirmed, which is that if you get these products, you will see and feel that they are Engine yeah. engineered exceptionally and uh, also that the technology in them is stuff that they have had to hire folks to make entirely that mm -hmm. most of it is not uh, sort of a plug and play device that yeah. they have had to engineer these panels that they have had to figure out the way to do the lighting system the connections and so they're paying good people, uh, good people meaning, you know, skilled people to make these things possible and they are putting money into making it the right way. And so all of that combines to, you know, make it so that it is more costly. But when you get it, you will see that it is a good product uh, that is well crafted. And yeah. that so far has been my experience. Um but the new products that are out are triangles and mini triangles, <laughs> uh, which combine together to create some new looks. So the hexagons uh, were announced uh, a while ago now, and that was the first of the shapes, the new shapes line. The new, they kept saying shapes, shapes, uh, because it, the shapes is the line yeah. and also there are <laughs> shapes within that shapes line. Um, That's so like the new my shortcuts, shapes, shortcuts shapes problem. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, are the triangles and mini triangles. And these products are not only uh, newer, but they are the most cost effective ones uh, that Nanoleaf has made. So they are listening uh, on that point as well about how well, um, <laughs> their, you know, their products have been pretty pricey. And there's a new mounting system. So uh, instead of, the, it's kind of hard to explain, the way that they mount now, um, you had to do it in such a way that, because they like to use those little um, command strips. Mm -hmm. And in order for a command strip to come cleanly off of a wall, you have to be able to pull on the end of the command strip. And in order to mount the current uh, nano leaf panels, uh, the tail of that strip needs to be sticking out yeah, in well. order for you to pull it. And so nobody does that. They make the strip go back farther so that you can't see the tail end. And so then it becomes difficult to unmount it. So they're doing yeah. a new thing where in the middle of these panels is a little nub and uh, a separate mounting bracket is what goes on the wall with the command strips on it. And then you can click on your panel afterward. So mm -hmm. you don't have to worry about peeling uh, paint off of your wall uh, and ruining your wall in any way. So I think... What this shows me, uh, what what you know, I like most about this is that it shows that Nanoleaf is listening to its customers, listening to the uh, you know complaints, but also the bravos and bravas uh, that that customers have had, and using all of that feedback to make you know changes to its lineup in cost and in mounting method and all of that yeah. stuff. So. They're listening, and I like that. I like when you can tell that a company really is hearing its customers. That makes sense. That's, these are awesome. Like I saw a lot of this at CES and was very interested. Same problem, though. It's like I, I think it's less expensive than I thought, 
now, especially with the variety, like it is still two hundred dollars for a seven hexagon starter kit, but it starts to I think the more variety and things like that start to make a difference. And I mean, I was just talking about how the Maras stuff with the lower quality or like lower fidelity light is fine, but also I've grown to appreciate having the life X strip of really high quality light and color and engineering, like you said, and just the features of being able to touch them and have them react or to music or all the home automation things. Like I still have not even, that's, that's like, <laughs> I'm trying to redo my office a lot, or I just have this one wall with, I have a couple things that art on it, but nothing really. And I kind of want these cause I could totally see walking up and running my home automations and everything changes and all that. So that is like, the super futuristic thing. It's almost just felt out of reach psychologically, maybe because it's so fancy seeming that now that they're maybe a little bit more affordable or you can have more design. I think that's the big thing is something yeah. unique to you and, or your corner, like even the little triangles one, they have an example where it is just in the corner of a room and that's usually a hard space to light. And so it could just be, if they are really high fidelity, having one of those small packs for, I think it's 120 bucks is like, you could actually really light up a room. And the whole thing of, we talked about this a couple times, but adding the color and the vibe to a space is going to be extra important going into the winter. Like having a space that you want to be in at all times is going to be important. And so souping it up a little bit with some of this cool stuff does have actual value to your daily life it's not as frivolous when you do (laughs) you're stuck in this space so kind of it is interesting how all of our decisions and making processes have changed a little bit this year and i mean the tech companies are reflecting it too like these smart home companies probably lucked out a bit by just being there it happened to line up with this that home kit stuff got a lot cheaper or they got through to their next product lines by now so it's kind of cool I agree. Um, the another cost-effective device is the, uh, the there's there's an article from Nine to Five Mac talking about the Voco Link. That's V O C O Link uh, LED light strip, and for thirty six ninety nine, so just under forty bucks, you can add a uh, light strip LED light strip to your home. Um, it, it it looks like it's hubless. Uh, which mm-hmm. is cool, and it is uh, 6.5 feet of lighting, and then you can buy extensions for $24 to add on top of that. Um, but yeah, if you're looking for some bias lighting for your television, or as we've kind of been talking about here, ways to add some uh, some nice ambiance to your space and a way to kind of cool up your space or or warm up your space, whichever, you know, color you want to go to. Uh, this is a way to do it without having to spend a hundred dollars or even, you know, 80 bucks um, on the more pricey light strips that are out there. Uh, it, yeah. it warms yeah. me to see these cost effective devices available and still <laughs> offer that home kit support, which tended in the past to carry a premium price tag. They do have their lumens specified, though, and it is 250 and I will say the LifeX one that I have is 1400 So Yeah. <laughs> Big I difference I think I might there. get one of these because it is, I think that's what's always, I mean, we even talked a couple months ago about building your own light strips and kind of things like that because some of the home kit things are just so pricey. And I think for like a closet or something like that where I just want some... I mean, like I'm a YouTuber, so I th- I feel like that's going to be a whole thing too, is just accent lighting and things like that. But a cheap way and just to maybe test out where you want a light strip or something like that is always mm-hmm. good too. So there is a whole variety here. Uh, Vocalink is next, another interesting brand too, yeah. Yeah. Uh, up next, we've got some Google news. Uh, first is the Google home. Uh, I love the, I love this, this headline from CNET. Google home finally gets the A L E X a feature. I've been waiting ages for, um, 
I, I don't know. I, I think that the feature parity is incredibly important. And I've talked about that before and we continue, we see companies do this a lot. Uh, Google, Apple, and Amazon being the big players in this space sort of try and make sure that they all have these features um, so that they can kind of match match wits. I don't know, match the others that are competing here. Mm-hmm. And uh, this time it comes to to routines, right? Yeah. the All those home leaving and goodbye automations. Like, I don't, I think this is one of the things that I just assumed they had and didn't realize it didn't because I set it all up with HomeKit. But that's the home and away location awareness stuff recently came to, into home and nest speaker type type things. And that is just, I think mostly what this article did highlight to me was how he's just like, I just use the echo stuff instead. And I think it's always easy to assume that there's an Amazon household and a Google household household and an Apple household, but like nobody lives that way <laughs> unless you work at the companies or something. I don't know. Like nobody actually, it's like, I'm only going to use one. I mean, maybe if you're trying to set up just that stuff, but I think there is people just kind of get what makes sense for them. Um, and so he's like been relying on the echo routines this whole time, even though he prefers a lot of the Google products. So I thought that was just an interesting thing. And you're right. is I think the feature pair, it's always easy to, easy to say these companies are just copying each other, but it is kind of dumb to leave out just obvious features yeah, that people yeah, want l- and are kind of the new thing that sometimes it might be a technological thing that didn't really make sense until now, but it's still like, I don't want to have to switch platforms just to get a single feature that they could just add. It's kind of like exactly. the whole, I feel like I'm uh, Kevin Systrom defending Instagram stories over Snapchat <laughs> when they just, they're like, it's a format, not a, feature. <laughs> yeah. Well, after saying basically shamelessly, yeah, we copied it, but that's because it makes sense to do yeah, so. Yeah. And yeah. yeah, I, I, you know, it's fun and, f- or it's not, I don't know if it's fun anymore. It, and I don't even know if it's really funny anymore. Maybe we <laughs> all just feel beholden to doing it. I don't know. There's, there is some, something to, to commenting on when things are uh, noticing a pattern, I guess. Maybe that's what it is. At, mm-hmm. at our heart, and not at our heart, at our brain, human beings love to find patterns and things. We love exactly. to try to find reason from what is chaos. And so you find a pattern and you want to talk about it and you want to share it with other people. And so you see a company uh, do a thing that another company has done and you feel the need to call it out. But yeah, it it's not so much that it's... Uh, oh, well, you know, I had it first and so I can be smug about it. And it's more about, cel- I think among us at least, we, when calling these things out, are celebrating the fact that everybody yeah. uh, or more people will have access to a feature. Um, exactly. Because, yeah, it's a lot of work to try and hop platforms just because yours doesn't have it and the other one does. And so, you know, it, I, it was not enough for me to hop to Android entirely because iOS didn't have widgets. Um, I, <laughs> anytime I used an Android device, loved the widgets that were there. But everything else that I like about iOS, I wanted to, to keep. And so it wasn't enough to change. But when iOS finally got widgets, I was happy about it. And yes, Android was doing it and it was great and it was there. I'm happy that more people have access to it. And the same applies to these companies that continue to, you know, reach parity with one another. This is just a celebration of the fact that no matter what platform, you can be sort of platform agnostic, no matter what platform you're using, you will have access to the same types of features on all of them. And I think that's more important than anything. Mm-hmm. Uh Let's see. Google smart displays are getting a massive and free upgrade. This you said you were going to show us, huh? Sure. I've got my display here available and I'll walk through it for all the listeners as well. But um, basically, Google has used to always just kind of surface things when you want them as opposed to giving you access to something whenever you desire um here let me try to get the ambient iq thing so you can see what's on the screen if you're watching um but now basically once you swipe away from your 
main profile page, I have curated art because I was seeing the same albums for about three years in a row. Um, need to get those updated. But once you swipe in, now there's a bunch of tabs at the top of the Google interface. So um, from your photo album, there's your morning, home control, media, communicate, and let me get over there, and discover. So basically, Google has started to break out the main features that they know that people are using with these devices and kind of a routine-based um, automatic screen at the beginning to give you more access to the stuff and make it more useful. There's kind of a quote from one of the Google executives saying, these are now going to be more smart, like actual smart displays that kind of was what we originally promised these things and less just here's a recipe or a timer control kind of thing. Um, so on my morning thing, I've got the weather controls. That's uh, automatically changing conveniently for me. Um, <laughs> then I'm in the office and those lights are on. So it knows this room is in the office in the Google home. So it's kind of like you probably want to control those while you're here. So that's kind of nice is I can just tap on it and turn off my lights and turn them back on, which is pretty convenient. Um, then still in the morning, it's got things coming up on my calendar. Um, I've got a, I do use iCloud, so I've got a shortcut that I try to add from my iCloud calendar onto my Google one just so I can see them on here. But it's got top stories for you. You could have a um, household contacts so that you can immediately contact somebody like your kid out of out of the house or something like that or your significant other. Um, and then in the smart home control, there's very large buttons in the center. Sorry if you're watching, there's a good amount of reflection <laughs> on my screen. Um, but you got speakers and uh, lights, speakers and TVs, routines and rooms. So kind of a lot of the stuff that you would access in the Google Home app now more visually in front of you. Um, and I do like the speakers and TV stuff because I could turn on my Xbox and maybe stop something that's playing on the TV. Um, I just recently got a monitor and to have an Xbox plugged in the back of it. And then I realized I have a old school media remote thing that I can use. And so I can actually watch YouTube videos on that pretty easily and tell my home hub to cast up to there. So that's kind of fun. And then media section, they've got more for YouTube, YouTube music, Google news and podcasts. It's very, it's very Google heavy. Like I do wish there was third party <laughs> stuff in there because it does kind of get into the like, you should only use Google products if you have this kind of thing, where, which wasn't really the original promise of Android. Um, but then they've got for the communicate thing, same type of broadcast feature, same as intercom on um, HomePod, making a video call. This doesn't actually have the camera on it, but you can have little meetings on here. Um, and then the discover thing is just a good way for skills to surface in that area like it says be my interpreter learn something new about tigers um add apples to my shopping list how many miles is a 5k like a bunch of just suggestions so none of that is all of that it seems like the main features that it's always had so i it should show more games or things like that that they've been adding support for but it's pretty cool it does just make the smart display be more of a utility thing like I have it's mostly been a photo frame for me something to watch YouTube videos on and occasionally get a recipe but now I want it's going to push itself to me a little bit more so I think that will be nice especially I haven't um the same way I was looking at my my Apple watch is doing the school time thing um I want to try their workday routines and stuff like that because that's kind of what this there's just a display on my desk for. So might as well take advantage of it now that they're actually pushing it more, which is great. Um, so this is interesting. Uh, Google has announced that it's discontinuing its Google Nest Secure alarm system. Uh, you may remember this as, I think, a pretty lauded uh, alarm system 
that provided some little uh, pucks that you could use to enter your home and sort of bypass the alarm, uh, door and window sensors and motion controls as well, or motion uh, detection. And it was introduced first in 2017. Uh, it had the NFC key fobs and Google uh, started selling it at 499. It dropped to 399. Um, as well okay. as, uh, well, oh, and then, and then there was a little bit of a concern, which was that um, <laughs> the system had an on device microphone. <laughs> <laughs> that Google didn't really talk about until it added Google Assistant support. So the idea was that, you know, oh, we're going to eventually add Google Assistant support. And then we'll talk about the microphone. Surprise, you have Google Assistant support on your device. But, you know, you kind of can't give put a microphone <laughs> in someone's home and not tell them that it's there. That's just not great. Um, and so, you know, that's been kind of uh, up and <laughs> back and I forth, mean, I guess. I, I feel like that's a pretty key line in this article. So like, I wonder why they discontinued this. It's because this is like the epitome example of what can be wrong with smart tech is they literally left it out of the documentation that this product contained a microphone and then decided to just tell you that it had a microphone when it activated it. So it was, <laughs> and it's Google. So it, this is like, this is why people are wary of Google. Like this exact, so like, this I'm surprised this article doesn't really lean into that, that this is clearly canceled because of this. It even seems like in, I mean, in August they partnered with ADT to do smart home security things. And it's kind of like, I don't think Google can do smart home security at this level because they don't have the trust. It's they tried it already and they immediately burned everybody. So it's pretty smart. I mean, maybe they'll come back to it in a few years or something like that, but that level of thing is that, I mean, I'm sure people just didn't buy this because it was like, oh, go Google it. And then you see this story. I'm even Googling it. Oh, man. <laughs> like looking up your own product in your own search engine and it's <laughs> shows how bad your <laughs> privacy is. So basically they cursed it and it kind of needed <laughs> to go away. But yeah, I'm sure that uh, it, it we'll see some new products from them and it'll just be branded as, you know, Nest uh, and ADT will end them will work together and make something new. But, um, yeah, don't, don't, don't microphone <laughs> don't do someone. That. You know, there was <laughs> one time, uh, a podcast I used to do, not this podcast, but a, or any of the twit podcasts, but a podcast I used to do. Um, we had a sponsor on this show and they sent us a product and I'm not going to talk about the product, um, because the, the question that I had, the whole thing was ironed out and figured out, but sent mm -hmm. us a product. Um, and it was an IOT kind of device. And I, anytime I bring IOT devices into my home, I always take them apart. Um, to the extent that I want to see the components inside. I don't go all the way and like, I don't do an iFixit yeah. teardown, but I basically <laughs> take off the outer shell and look inside. And so I had this frame and I took off the outer shell and looked inside and inside was what could be nothing other than a microphone. And mm -hmm. it was posi positioned in such a way that you couldn't tell that there was a microphone inside because the place where uh, it would it would the the way that it was facing uh, toward the front of the device um, it had it didn't have any holes or anything like that mm -hmm. it was just a little mount for it and so the microphone was inside and it was mm -hmm. wired to a place on the chip where it said mic um, wow. and <laughs> so. I, and there was no mention in any documentation yeah. or anything about a microphone. So the first thing I did was simply unclip the microphone from the board and then put it all back together and it all still worked just fine. Um, mm -hmm. But I immediately reached out. Well, I reached out to my folks who reached out to the company and said WGF um, and it was the same thing. In the future, we might provide support that would involve the use of a microphone. So we want to make sure to have it in there now. Okay, well, then you need to include that on your website. Yeah. 
you that needs to be part of the the uh, documentation. So that was corrected. Don't know how it got as far as it did without it being corrected, but it was corrected. Um, and so I guess the moral of the story is take apart your gadgets. Um, yeah. And also for you uh, device manufacturers out there, don't do that because that's not a good look. And it's yeah. never good to go later and say, oh, by the way, we brought a microphone into your house without letting you know about it. Or a camera, for God's sake. Ugh. <laughs> um, let's see. What do we have left? Um, oh, uh, so our friend, friend of the show, friend of Twit and uh, panelist on This Week in Google. Um, well, I guess it's her site, we should say. So it's Stacy on IoT, yeah. uh, Stacy Higginbotham's site. Um, Kevin Tofel has written an yeah. article there. Uh, Google assembles all the parts of a truly smart home. We must have been reading the same timeline this morning because I saw this post fly by. Um, <laughs> and it's kind of talking about how Google has almost quietly, uh, maybe not for those who are super fans of Google, but for other people perhaps uh, quietly, um, brought together all the things that you need uh, for for a smart home. I mean, Google does Wi-Fi. Google has the Nest Audio. Uh, you've got the... Oh, and the, I should note that the Nest Wi-Fi also is a Google Assistant smart speaker. Um, and so it kind of takes on all of the different parts that you need for a smart home. And then you've got the smart displays with the Nest Hub and Nest Hub Max. And so it's all there. And I think that Google has done this mostly um, just slowly but surely, uh, making sure that it can kind of reach all parts of the, the smart home. And it's Chromecast devices serving as little uh, yeah. smart display options yeah. as well, I think is really cool. I just bought a Chromecast um, to connect to my uh, television simply for the purpose of casting my Oculus Quest 2 to my television. Oh, um, save it for the project. That's what I want. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Then I, you didn't hear <laughs> that. Woo, 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 woo. One moment. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I love that. That, I, Or I think it's really cool that uh, Google is kind of like, all right, so we'll do this, we'll do this, we'll do this, we'll do this. And then suddenly they've just got it all covered. You can kind of yeah. go to them. And because of Nest um, and their Wi-Fi holds holdings, you've got the whole kit and caboodle covered, uh, including you know the thermometers, the cameras, the uh, carbon monoxide detectors and smoke mm -hmm. detectors, et cetera. Yeah, exactly. It's a good. It's a good piece. It's especially I liked. I mean, I don't want to give everything away, but he's talking about how. Like last year at CES, or not this year, but the year before, it was like the smart home isn't really smart. And a lot of Google's stuff is slowly combining their AI type machine learning stuff with on device processing. So it's a little more private. And they seem to kind of, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure because I just don't know their roadmap, but it does seem like they kind of have finished their rollover to the Nest branding with their home devices and it's kind of a the next era of smart home stuff for them so it's pretty interesting to just see these companies kind of this is almost like the start of the next phase of smart home stuff we'll see maybe peach Oip is going to be phase three or if that's part of this phase as well um i mean it's already happening so i guess not yet but <laughs> but yeah it's a, it's definitely interesting like they're even talking about um, the like my Nest Hub has it, and I haven't turned it on, but it has that presence detection using ultrasonic pulses, which is like that might fall into the line of the tell me about this with the microphone thing. Um, <laughs> I guess that just comes from the speakers, so that's a little bit weird still. That it's like I know you're standing in front of me, um, but the big thing that they're testing is like if you're standing in front of it, you might just not have to use the wake word, and then you can just start using your smart home without invoking a major corporation's name in your home every day. So <laughs> that's always the weird part about Google. So, <laughs> hmm. um, all right, up next, we've got our project. Mm, yeah. So let's talk about our project and, uh, and media consumption. Mm -hmm. Cause I mean, there's a, 
slight tie in with the news from last week, um, but also kind of falling into that line of smart displays have been getting better and we're going into fall and winter months more and more. And so it's been six months of lockdown for me of <laughs> getting through too much stuff. Um, it's like binging a lot of things. And so I kind of, I want to talk to you about how you're consuming media and the different ways to do it. And maybe if there's a streaming service you use or perhaps are not using anymore because it went away. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking about Quibi because the, I mean, it's, it's a whole internet bashing session. I feel like a lot of people, including me, were maybe a little bit too smug about Quibi in the news is going away. Um, because they basically doesn't seem like they got enough users and there's a, a lot of, it seems like some tone deaf announcements from the guy being like, we could never know if it was the pandemic or just the idea wasn't good. And a lot of people are like, pretty sure the idea wasn't the ba the best in the world of a lot of the discussion then turns to, you can't just parachute in with Hollywood and create a successful platform for the internet when a lot of internet culture is created by black creators and a lot of smaller groups that don't get that recognition or the money that could have gone towards media that they're producing instead of $1.75 billion for Quibi, which launched at CES six months ago. So like it's pretty or eight months ago. So it's a little <laughs> intense downfall there. Um, I, d I do just want to talk about it cause we did talk about it originally and I was being a, a butt about like, <laughs> I'm not going to be watching it later on and you were enjoying the shows. So I don't know. I just don't want to be a hater. And <laughs> I'm curious I what mean, you think. Yeah. I think that the important thing is, um, it didn't work and it is very easy from the outside, uh, to come up with all the reasons that something doesn't work. Um, because you could just throw almost anything and say it didn't work because Samantha uh, Bernstein was walking along one day and she uh, swatted away a fly which flew into the eye of this person <laughs> which led to that person never watching this episode of Quibi which led to them not talking about it right. with this person. I mean like there are so many different things that <laughs> play a role and you can say any reason why something failed, but there are big reasons why it did not, it was not successful. And I think that there was a lot of hubris involved with this, mm -hmm. uh, platform. And I think that that's why it's so delicious, uh, to joke and to kind of, uh, give into the schadenfreude of the situation, <laughs> because especially if you are a millennial or younger, because they, you know, oh, we know what millennials want and we know what they yeah. are going to be after and all that <laughs> kind of thing. And so you, there's a lot of eye rolling that automatically happens. And so it's understandable kind of why you would be, why anyone would be kind of like, haha, of course this wasn't going to work or I told you so. Um, but I think that that, you know, we can acknowledge that it didn't work. There were clear reasons why it didn't work. Um, and I think that for the most part, the shows didn't end up being this sort of value yeah. proposition that, Quibi was putting out there, they didn't really hold true to it in the end. And I think that people still are more interested in, um, other more, uh, yeah, familiar forms of media. And so it, it just didn't work and that that's fine. Um, it's especially, you know, I, I mean, like as a YouTuber, it is the value proposition is what a lot of YouTube is already doing for people. And, it's just like turn your phone or like the cool technology, which I think they really underemphasized or is inherently like some sort of gimmick thing that it could just be like I saw that the day before that they announced that they were closing down. They had this big documentary with Vice and I thought it looked interesting, but I was kind of like, I don't want to watch it on Quibi um, <laughs> or like they they were just talking about moving to the Apple TV to actually watch videos in the way that people tend to consume content. And so I think that's why it is an interesting, like how do you actually consume stuff like this at, especially with the way the world has changed of you were talking about your Chromecast thing. Um, 
I mean, there's, I've got a tablet, a phone, computer, um, the quest thing now too. That's a whole, whole different world, <laughs> literally watching mm-hmm. it in 3d or something like that. Um, so I'm curious, what are your like main things? Uh, so for me, Netflix is for me at least, but (laughs) for me, the main, main method of media consumption, Ooh, main method of media consumption, main method of media makings is (laughs) Netflix, Hulu, uh, I actually, I start in Apple TV in the Apple TV app, uh, Mm -hmm. because everything outside of Netflix is there and, uh, whether I'm watching content from uh, Apple TV just added AMC Premiere to its service, which is awesome. Um, and my partner and I watch a lot of AMC, or not a lot, but a few AMC shows. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can get all the Hulu shows there. Pretty much everything is right there. So I can kind of just keep it in my watch now and kind of stay up with what that is. Um, so that's where most of my media consumption happens. But other, or other than that, it's audiobooks, Um, and so that's obviously via the audible app on my iPhone. And that usually happens at night. Obviously. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I use the books app. I don't, but it's oh. terrible. Like, it's yeah, I guess I shouldn't either. say obviously yeah. for me, <laughs> it is kidding. obvious because that's where my library is. But yeah, that, that you may get your books from, there are other, uh, audiobook platforms out there. Um, and I'm trying to think, of any other media consumption that I do. Uh, no, I mean, those are the big things because even for the debates, um, I watched those through the Apple TV app. I mean, it came from other places, but the Apple TV app had it for me to just click a button and start watching. Um, so really that's it. Uh, I get the New York times in print uh, as well as digital, uh, just as a way to support them. And so, uh, occasionally I'll pull out the old, newspaper and look at some of the different pieces in there. Uh, but yeah, I think that streaming media, uh, through the Apple TV is where most of mine happens. The thing that I was talking about before, uh, the Oculus quest lets you stream what is visible on within the device to a compatible, uh, external screen. And so, you can open the Oculus app on a phone or on a, a tablet and cast, send that that view over to that device. And so I mentioned that I get pretty VR sick with games where you uh, don't get to stand still or use the space to move around, but instead you move around by you know using a joystick or something like that. That just, I can't do it. Um, and, but my partner can for shorter periods of time. And so he's been playing a walking dead game and occasionally I will watch him play, uh, from, you know, the iPad or the iPhone or whatever, but I wanted to cast it to the television cause it'd be, you know, on the big screen, it'd be easier to see. And, um, then I could do other things on my phone or my tablet. Um, but the problem was you have to have th- the Oculus Quest only will cast to Chromecast devices. And so mm-hmm. I bought uh, a Chromecast to plug into the Apple TV because they're not that expensive. And um, there are other apps that do casting to Chromecast. And so I got one in order to see the Oculus Quest uh, on the big screen. And that's been kind of fun watching him play nice. and sort of saying, oh, well, look out, look out for that or Oh no, do you know, go over there or whatever. So I guess that's one other media consumption <laughs> format that I've used, uh, along with the others. Um, is a, does that have to be to a physical Chromecast or is it just any Chromecast compatible? I think anything that supports yeah. casting Google's casting mm. protocol will work. So, um, could maybe you, put it on my little hub. <laughs> yeah, I would, I would think Why? so actually that you could do it on the Macs as long as if you can cast from like a phone to the, uh, nest hub, then you should be able to, uh, do it with the, the Oculus app. There's like in the top right corner of the Oculus app, there's a little button that looks like it's like half an Oculus headset and half a little Chromecast icon and yeah, you tap exactly. on that. 
and then it'll show you the Chrome or the Oculus devices that you have at the top and you choose one. And then at the bottom, it shows you what you can cast to. And by default, it just shows the actual device that you're using. So it says this phone, but then there's a little button you can press that says search for other devices or something like that. You tap yeah. on that and then it'll look for casting compatible devices that you have in your house. It's pretty impressive. Like I thought it was a lot more complicated and even just being able to plug it into the computer and show people or the TV set is like, cause that's a, a big thing is it's a pretty solo experience. It's like, Oh, this is so cool. And then the other people are just watching you being like waving stuff around in the air. So yeah, it's always a little funny. Um, yeah, I assume you have like a traditional TV set. I guess I'm just curious cause I'm going to be watching more stuff on like a monitor now and, uh, I get yeah, like I've the whole a, PC gamer experience thing there. Um, uh, my main television is a 4K HDR TCL smart TV, but I don't use any of the smart TV apps that are built into it um, because I've got an Apple TV 4K, which is where I do most of that stuff. Um, my partner has an Xbox uh, that he uses on it. And then the third HDMI is for the the Chromecast, which, like I said, I just got, and it's just for right now casting from the Oculus. So w- he and I watch shows on that uh, 4K TV in the living room, um, and then I will use my iPad Pro for watching shows that just I want to watch. Um, I never, I very rarely, uh, if ever, use my phone for any kind of video media consumption um even youtube videos and stuff like that i will (laughs) go to the ipad almost always i don't know there's something something in my brain that does not like using the phone as a as a screen uh in that way i i like did that a little bit um interestingly i think it was only for the marvel netflix shows so like iron fist and those all, all those ones that got canceled um they probably got canceled because people like my girlfriend refused to watch them because she was like, this is dumb. Um, (laughs) And I think it was at the time, maybe like the iPhone display was new. And so I wanted to, it's basically like, it's got a better screen than even my TV is still really nice, but it does have really rich colors at the OLED screen and stuff like that. And so I think I watched a lot of the, I would download them and then just watch them on my phone. Um, Because it was like, She's like, this is terrible acting and <laughs> stuff like that if I'm playing it out loud. Um, I think yeah. YouTube particularly, I'm always interested how other people watch it because it is like totally different depending on the person. A lot of people only watch in their browser. Some people only ever watch on their phone. Like gamer type people I think do actually watch on the Xbox a good amount just because it's built in and like mine is 4K as opposed to um, I guess the Apple TV now. I don't even know if it's officially rolled out, but can do 4K videos now from YouTube um, because they got that agreement together. Um, But the smart display thing is, I think, another interesting realm. Like I'm tempted to put this one back in the kitchen and watch YouTube videos at lunch there while because now that I have the Xbox plugged into this monitor that I have in front of me, I can cast to... I think you can cast to the Xbox, I'm pretty sure, so... I don't know if you need a Chromecast if you already have the Xbox. Um, I'm, I'll have to test that, I guess. But um, yeah, I looked on yeah. I looked on Oculus's help pages, and it just said Chromecast was what you could use. So yeah, if you can cast I'll, also to the Xbox, that. that's cool. Yeah, exactly. and also kind of um, annoying because I bought a Chromecast. <laughs> yeah, that's why I was like, oh, that sucks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but audiobooks are the other interesting thing. And like, I'm probably going to try that continue your podcast thing now more. Um, I mean, podcasts, not audiobooks, but I, I use, yeah, I use iBooks and it's always kind of, it just has like 35 tracks with no named files and they're like, it doesn't match up to the chapters or anything like that. So I think that's really something that would be nice if they improve that in the next year. Um, there is a shortcut for it so I can, resume a book at least with books it's like you you know the one book you're listening to so it's not right. a, like picking through a bunch of options with shortcuts like that um but it is i think the home pod minis are going to be an interesting and i want to try out more of the um 
my smart speakers around the place because I had to, I literally had to test over weeks and weeks with my girlfriend of like, is it okay if I listen to music in the morning? Because I'm always, I'm, I guess I'm too nice, but I'm always concerned about waking her up because I know that it's, it's fine until the one time that I actually do wake you up and then it's like, why the heck yeah, you wake me up? Then um, it's yeah. <laughs> so it's, exactly. But, but the HomePod does, I think the big thing that when I first got about it, it is about audio fidelity. So even when it is at 10%, and it's on the desk, you can hear what they're saying. And something like a HomePod or a little Nest Hub mini is like really hard to hear unless you turn it up or then you're starting to project it across the room and things like that. Um, I guess the one thing I'm curious about that I did realize is, of course, this always happens, is I got a monitor and then it's like, oh, I need speakers for this monitor now because I'm not used to having a computer that doesn't have good speakers built in like the iMac just has it and I never really use it too much. So I'm trying to figure out like my Amazon echo has a line in, do I plug that in and can I use that with my computer and things like that? I'm kind of, I have 20 speakers lying around like all these little <laughs> echoes and things like that. And so I was trying to like, maybe I'll try to set up a two nest minis and have a surround sound thing with those and kind of do a real comparison of all of these the generations too of smart speakers because there's so there's so much variety and it does kind of like my whole setup and how i'm going to use this stuff has just entirely changed because i bought one other screen so i'm curious if people have unique ways like i want to know how people are watching youtube um i just released a bunch of shortcuts in my newsletter that jumps into the watch later playlist for YouTube or other playlists that you save. Cause I always don't take advantage of those. I think I had videos from three years ago in my watch later playlist. Um, <laughs> I had like 500 and wow. put them all into actual playlists. And I was like, Oh, I want to watch more YouTube videos now because it's not overwhelming. Um, so there's kind of, I feel like especially going into the winter, I want to like, use this stuff well, not just default to Netflix in front of the TV and get off the couch and kind of have some variety, watch a video on my phone more often or something like that just while I'm like doing stuff around the house and kind of break out of just binging old TV shows that I've seen already. <laughs> I am not going to watch The Office this winter, I swear. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll end up watching all of it. Right, exactly. Um, I think that means it's time for us to move on to our last topic, which, of course, is our picks of the week. Um, uh, first, I'll mention mine. Uh, the new iPhone is out, and one of the things that folks uh, should know, if if you are planning on getting a new iPhone, is that it no longer includes a charging adapter in the box. Mm -hmm. um, you will have to supply your own charging adapter. Uh, you know, there's uh, there's conversation there, especially surrounding the fact that up to this point, the charging adapters that have come in iPhone boxes have been USB-A type uh, cables. And the new uh, iPhone comes with a USB-C type cable in the box, USB-C to lightning. Um, and so a lot of people don't have you well the argument would be is that a, that a lot of people don't have USB C type uh, charging adapters at home and so I wanted to mention one um, Anchor has the Anchor Nano uh, it is a 20 watt charging adapter which is uh, a very that that's a good amount of juice um, mm -hmm. for that's actually the perfect amount of juice for the new iPhones. But that also means that it is the perfect amount of juice for uh, your Android devices, uh, for tablets, for all sorts of things uh, that would need USB-C. And uh, Anchor has done a good job of making it the same size as Apple's old yeah. five watt charging adapter. That's the so, big one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it packs in 20 watts of charging and does not require any more space uh, to provide that charging. So you'll get a faster charge, taking up the same amount of space, 
Um, and for $16.99, you can have this. There you go. Same size, way more power it shows next to that 5-watt charging adapter. Um, with uh, GAN technology built in, which is gallium nitride, which is a, a, a new way of creating a more efficient charging chip in your device. And so yeah, you get a tiny little, tiny little dealy, and it's got the USB-C uh, port on it. Plug it in. Plug in your device, whether it's an iPhone, an Android device, or something else, and you're good to go. And, of course, it will work with the new MagSafe chargers that are available for the iPhones uh, 12. So that yes. is my pick of the week, $16.99 uh, on Amazon and on Anchor's own website. Uh, Matthew. Oh, well, there you go. Uh, <laughs> what is your... They fit in an outlet and they fit in an outlet sideways because that's always what the new USB-C ones are all... They fit like in a vertical outlet, but if the on a power strip, if the plugs are sideways, you can't put two side that's by side. Exactly. And I don't know how well it charges an iPad Pro. It looks like it technically can like probably decently slow because it's they are spec'd up for more than that. But this is just this is like buy this to replace your little five watt ones and hopefully recycle those because that's Apple's whole yes. reason for not keeping them in the box. Recycle the <laughs> Uh, they sold these, they pretty much sold out during uh, prime day. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they can be kind of tough to get, but it shows um, anchor is selling them on Amazon's website. So you can get them uh, shipping in three to four days. Uh, it looks like, yeah, free shipping. So uh, head to that link and you can get that, uh, get that there. What's your nice. pick of the week for us? Um, mine is another awesome product from the folks at Studio Neat, which they just launched this morning, is their material dock for, it's a wooden dock for MagSafe. And then there's also an Apple Watch dock option. So um, the big thing this year is the MagSafe chargers where it'll connect to the back of your iPhones in a big magnetic puck and make a big click and also, you should know if you have a leather case, will likely ruin it um, or leave rings on it. So that's always good to be aware of. Is I probably not going to go with the leather case because of that. Um, but what Studio Neat has is a little wooden, almost like a, a cup holder type thing. Or um, uh, I'm blanking on the name. I have one right in front of me. What are they called? These a things. coaster. Um, yeah, coaster. There we go. That's a word um <laughs> but it's like a little coaster for the magsafe thing but i think the idea very similar to their um apple tv remote one is that you stick this onto your desk in one spot and then the material or the magsafe dock fits into it and just stays there so that's always kind of a thing is all these magsafe docks are just going to be kind of floating around on your desk and then you have a big three inch puck that falls onto the floor or something <gasps> like that. Um, oh, they're using micro suction. I love micro suction pads. So yeah, they're the I, best. Oh, that's the best technology that. So um, they're kind of, I, I just like quickly so that people sure. understand <laughs> there's micro suction and there's sticky and sticky can of course leave residue and build up. But micro suction is essentially making a, a spongy material that can create a suction force, uh, on, a surface. And so you clean the mm -hmm. surface, you stick the micro suction pad on it and it like a suction cup sticks to that surface. And then when you choose to remove it, it doesn't leave residue. Oh, yeah. that's, so nice. that's a big thing is that you can remove it. Um, and so, I mean, but it's mostly to keep the MagSafe thing in one spot. They also just look really nice. Like all of their wood materials are pretty solid quality. And then they have a, an Apple watch version that has a little, foam thing sitting up and you slide the watch charger up into that and then you can charge your watch and your phone next to each other with a nice wood quality look um so these i mean it's also like fairly affordable i think that's what's always yeah good you immediately expect these. something like this to cost 40 bucks just because they can charge it for the dock and then 70 dollars for the other thing but it's $20 for the dock and then 48 for the combo thing it's like you are buying your own charger it's not a integrated charger like a lot of those but i think that's what's nice and their apple tv remote thing is like i bought that the day i got the apple tv remote and every single person who's complained about having the remote i'm like my problem was solved by this 
tiny <laughs> little product from Studio Nate because all you have to do is, it's, yeah, it's fifteen dollars and you just stick it on your coffee table and then it props the Apple TV remote up in the air and it's kind of a nice little look there too. So I love these guys' products; they do awesome stuff. Yeah, the micro section is on the Apple TV one too, so I've been able to move it around, which is nice. It's like these are all great and they're a great company to support. There you go. Uh, folks, that brings us to the end of another episode of Smart Tech Today. If you have questions, thoughts, concerns, etc., you can email those stt at twit.tv. That stands for Smart Tech Today. Uh, if you want to tune in live, you can do so. We record the show live every Monday at 11 a.m. Pacific time. <clears throat> You just head to twit.tv slash live where we've got something broadcasting live at almost all time. I think it, yeah, pretty much all the time. Uh, but the best way to watch the show, the best way to be a part of the show and to tune into the show is by subscribing to the show because then you'll get it as soon as it's available. We have it in audio and video formats. You just click that subscribe to audio or subscribe to video button and then choose the method you want to use. So Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, et cetera. We are there and we are not square, and we are happy uh, for you to to subscribe to the show in those ways. Matthew Castanelli, if folks want to follow you online and see all the great work you are doing, where do they go to do so? This week, you should follow me on Twitter at Matt Castanelli. That's C-A-S-S-I-N-E-L-L-I, if you haven't already. I'll be sharing some more of the stuff that I'm sending out in my newsletters on Twitter, and I do actually have a good it's Casanelli Media is a second account that is just going to be more of a feed of those links because I, I feel like I'm annoying people. <laughs> <by tweeting out. laughs> like, oh, I'm live, I'm live now. How about now? It's like there's a good way you can follow all of that and I'll still share some from there, but it's a good, it's in my bio there. So, yeah. Oh, cool. What about you? Uh, you can follow me on pretty much all of the social media networks. Woo, excuse me. At Micah Sargent, um, including on telepath the new social media network that folks are enjoying um and of course head to chihuahua.coffee that's c-h-i-h-u-a-h-u-a dot coffee where i've got links to the various places you can find me online and photos of my dogs there at the bottom uh for your viewing ple- viewing and awing pleasure uh folks please make a plan go vote don't forget vote early if you can I would say vote early, vote often, but don't do that second part. Just vote early uh, if you can or vote day of, but make a plan and go vote. We do appreciate you for tuning in and it is time to say good afternoon to your smart assistants. School's out. Can actually uh, school's, uh, exit school time. <laughs> <laughs> exit Let's... school's left. One right. hour and 19 minutes. Hey, what's going on, everybody? I am Ant Pruitt, host at Twit TV. Got a question for you. Have you gotten tired of how bad your photos are looking every time you post them to Instagram? Better yet, have you gotten yourself a new camera and you can't quite figure out why the images just don't look that good? Well, I have a solution for you. This is my show, Hands On Photography. Each and every Thursday, I sit down and share different tips and tricks that are going to help make you a better photographer and a better post processor. So subscribe today at twit.tv hop to learn more.